Welcome back for another motion graphics tutorial in which we'll create the title animation you just saw. For this project you'll need 15 kilograms of powdered magnesium, a metal workshop, a hundred piece orchestra, a camera and half a tub of ice cream. Alternatively you could do everything on the computer using Blackmagic Fusion or DaVinci Resolve. You'll still need the ice cream though to provide valuable comfort when you eventually realize that you've spent half an hour watching an obscure YouTube channel which no one has ever heard of. This project should be ideal for beginners and intermediate users. It's intended to be just a bit of fun messing around in the third dimension, but I can't be held responsible if you end up actually learning something. Personally, I prefer using standalone fusion most of the time, but I'll be using DaVinci Resolve for this project since that's what all the cool kids seem to be using these days. There's a download link below for some assets which will get us up and running quickly. The FBX file contains a simple 3D scene consisting of a couple of spheres, some pointy bits, rotating rings, a camera and a couple of lights. There are also some textures to slap onto the geometry, a couple for the title and a single texture for everything else. I'll start with a brand new project and set the format to full HD and the frame rate to 30 frames per second. I'll create a new fusion clip and make it 9 seconds long, which is slightly longer than the 250 frames of animation we're about to import. I'll create a timeline for the edit page and drag and drop the provided assets from the file system into the media pool. Notice that I'm not including the FBX file at this stage because that would only give me a single node in Fusion, which is not what I want. I'll drag the Fusion clip into the timeline and double click on it to open it on the Fusion page. In the Fusion settings window, I'll double check that the format is Full HD. This project uses a lot of brightness transformations and 8-bit colour depth just wouldn't cut the mustard, so I'll set the colour depth to one of the float options. Now I can go ahead and import the FBX file from the Fusion menu, which will import all the 3D elements as separate nodes, so I can edit them. There are quite a few import options here, but right now I just want to get going, so just make sure all the checkboxes are ticked, except for the inverse transform, and be sure to set the frame rate to 30 frames per second, which is what I used to create the FBX. Also, double check that the scene animation will be imported. Notice that even though the FBX animation is 250 frames, Fusion thinks the duration is 1 second, so we'll need to fix that after importing. I'll click on OK, and Fusion builds an entire node graph using the FBX file. I'll just adjust my panels to get a better view, and you'll find that importing an FBX always gives these columns of nodes, with your image files on the left, then 2D texture nodes, materials, and 3D objects, which get combined with a 3D merge node. By the way, in my original scene I had a parent-child relationship between concentric ring 1 and the title band geometry, and I can see that Fusion has preserved that relationship by chaining the nodes together. That way, any transforms applied to the parent will be inherited by the child, so that's cool. Now the chances of an imported FBX being an exact match for the original 3D scene are about as likely as Transformers 5 winning an Oscar for Best Screenplay, so you'll always need to start by exploring the scene and finding and fixing all the stuff which isn't right. I won't lie, this stage may involve some amount of hair pulling, but once you've ironed out the wrinkles, it's all fun and games. As I mentioned, the render range has been set to 1 second, but if I switch to the edit page and back again, that gets updated to the clip's duration. It's also a good idea to check that the total length of animation has come in correctly. I'll select one of the animated nodes, such as one of the rings, and I can see in the timeline that the keyframes go up to 250 frames, which is what it should be. Now I'll load the 3D merge node into the viewer and see what I've got. By default, the perspective is at the centre of the scene, so I can't see anything much because I'm inside the sun, which is not a good place to be, as NASA discovered during their ill-fated solar landing mission. To explore the scene, you'll need to know the basics of navigating in 3D. If you're a beginner, I'd recommend the 3D Quick Start video, which is linked below, and is only 3 minutes long. Alternatively, here's a cheat sheet covering the basics. You might want to pause the video and try out some of these if you're a bit rusty. To get myself oriented, I'll switch to wireframe display and zoom right out to see everything. If I want to focus on a particular element, I can select a node in the flow, and when the viewer has focus I can press Ctrl F to frame selected. I'll also load the Merge 3D node in the second viewer, and to look through the render camera, 
I'll right click on the camera name in the corner, which is perspective, and select camera instead. Now I can play it back and see what I've got. OK, everything's gone horribly flat shaded and I can't see what I'm looking at because by default it's ignoring the lights and using flat shading. So I'll right click and turn on lighting from the 3D menu. And now it's even worse. It looks like maybe it's way overexposed, so this might be a good time to take a closer look at the lights which I put in the scene. In my original 3D scene, I kept things super simple by just aiming a spotlight at everything. But I needed to add a kick to the outer rings, so I added a point light near the camera. I didn't want that to illuminate the whole scene, so to keep it localised, I set the decay type to linear. That makes the light intensity decrease over distance, so the intensity needed to be higher. In Fusion, it looks like both the spotlight and point light have been imported, and if I check out the point light in the inspector, I can see that the intensity value is correct, but the colour has defaulted to a light grey instead of white, and more importantly, the decay type is still at the default value of no decay, which explains why the lighting is blown out. If I change that to linear decay, I can finally see what I'm doing. And since we're looking at lights, I'll take a look at the spotlight too. Now, this one is supposed to have no decay. I'll change the colour to pure white, just to match what I had in my original scene, and I also notice the cone angle hasn't been imported correctly, so I'll bump that all the way up to 90 degrees, as it should be. I realise that things are starting to look overexposed again, but that's because the textures are missing and everything's white, so we'll sort that out shortly. But for now, it's good enough for me to play through the rest of the animation to make sure that the geometry and motion are all there. OK, so there's a bit of a problem, which is there should be some geometry sliding into frame at the end of the shot, but it seems to be missing. I know the mesh is called title band, so I'll select that node and frame it in the other viewer, and I'll change to shaded display for a better view. OK, it looks like the geometry is right in front of the camera, where it should be, but it's not showing up on the render camera, so let me check the clipping planes on the camera. Aha! For some reason, Fusion decided to multiply my camera clipping values by 10, so I'll need to set those values back to 1 and 2000. If I just type new values into the inspector, it won't work, because Fusion automatically locked the entire camera node on import. So I'll need to unlock the node at the top of the inspector before I can change those parameters. And now that I've fixed the near clipping plane, I can see the missing geometry. Hooray! By the way, locking the camera node is actually a really good idea because it's so easy to accidentally move or adjust the camera and damage the animation you imported. So I'll definitely keep the camera node locked when I'm not working on it. The last things we have to tidy up are the materials and textures, and to see those at their best, I'll add a renderer 3D node to the flow. I'll load that in the viewer and set it to OpenGL for nice fast hardware rendering, which is usually a good place to start. In case you missed the memo, Fusion's 3D renderer is a fairly basic scan line renderer, so it doesn't support ray tracing, path tracing, principal shading, or anything like that. But its strength is in the way it can be integrated with 2D compositing. By default, it uses flat shading, so I'll need to turn on lighting. I can leave everything else at the default because super sampling is on by default, and we don't need shadows. Since I'm only starting to set up the render, I want playback to be as fast as possible, so I'll right click near the transport controls and turn off high quality and motion blur. I'll also turn on proxy so that 2D images are down -rezzed. Now we're ready to sort out the textures and materials. The texture maps may have imported correctly, depending on your software, the FBX options and which way the wind is blowing, but in this case I got one useless media in node, so I'll delete that and from the media pool I'll drag in and rename the three texture maps. A diffuse map for the sun material, a diffuse map for the title material, and a grayscale bump map also for the title material. OK, I don't need the media pool of the inspector just now. Now, this node which is connected to all the materials got a strange name from my FBX file, but it's actually just a 2D texture node, so I'll give it a more generic name. It doesn't actually contain a texture, but it takes an image as the input, and then maps that onto UV coordinates, which are ideal for 3D geometry. 
Although you can often get away with connecting images directly to materials, it's a good habit to connect them through a 2D texture node. That way you have more control over the UV layout, such as tiling or wrapping around, which is especially useful when the UVs on your meshes extend outside the 0 to 1 range. Let's see what happens if we connect the Sun Diffuse texture map to all the materials via the 2D texture node. That's actually mostly correct. I can see that the concentric rings, the sun, and the background map now have the correct material applied. But if I jump to the end of the timeline, the texture on the title band geometry is all kinds of wrong. I named that material title material, and if I disconnect the input for that material node, the geometry turns white, which is a good start. Now I'm going to connect the title diffuse map directly to the title material because I'm just that crazy. I broke my own rule about using Texture 2D nodes to map textures in UV space, and the gods of 3D have unleashed their wrath by stretching my textures at the edges. So before I get struck down by lightning, which would make this video much more exciting but would probably put a dent in my atheism, I'll insert a new 2D texture node into the flow. I'm copying and pasting the existing one since the wrap mode is already correct. Next I'll take a closer look at the material parameters. We've got blend materials by default, which should be OK. The diffuse colour has defaulted to a light grey, and if you're building materials from scratch that's fine because it gives you a little bit of headroom, but I'd prefer to match my original 3D scene, so I'll set those to white. The incandescent material managed to import the light orange colour correctly, so I'll leave that alone. Speaking of the incandescent material, that's applied to the sphere at the centre of the sun, named Sun Core, so I'll move that node closer to its geometry node, despite the fact that the rest of the graph is so messy I wouldn't be surprised if it gets me banned from the Confusion Discord. In my original scene, the Sun Core had a basic emission shader, and we can achieve the same effect here in Fusion by going to the Sun Core node, which is the geometry itself, and turning off affected by lights. Now it's flat shaded, which looks pretty lame, but hopefully we can turn it into an exploding ball of hydrogen before you lose interest and start watching YouTube cat videos. There's just one last texture map to address, which is the bump map for the title. I'll add a bump map node, and connect it directly to the material. I'll just zoom in on the render a bit so I can see what I'm doing. The first thing to set is the image type, which should be set to height map if you have a grayscale height map like we have here, or set to bump map only if the input image is a normal map, which usually looks quite blue. If I drag the height scale slider, you can see the height of the bump going up and down. I'll set the filter size to 5 for a nice smooth fall off, and I'll set the height to a subtle 1.5 or so, because frankly, exaggerated bump maps are the hallmark of amateur CG from the 90s. I'll also change the wrap mode to wrap so that it repeats. Ok, that's it for the bump, but I think we can improve on the specular highlight for this material. Instead of dialing in specular values for the entire object, we can use a texture map to define which regions of the surface are shiny or smooth, and which are dull or diffuse. Typically you'd want to create a separate texture map for this, but in this case I'm going to be completely outrageous and recycle my existing bump map, because it just so happens that I want the raised areas to be nice and shiny and reflective, and the remaining areas to be diffuse. When you're making fun of me in the comments section, don't forget to mention that I'm the kind of Muppet who connects bump maps to specular inputs. Now, even Fusion doesn't believe I could be this incompetent, so I have to hold down the ALT key on my keyboard, and drag the OUTPUT knot from the bump texture onto the title material node. I get a pop-up which offers me a list of input connections, and I'll choose specular colour material. It looks better already, now the darker regions don't look so washed out. I'll load the material node in the inspector to refine the specular settings. In case you haven't worked with blend shaders before, the intensity just scales the brightness of the specular highlight, and the exponent controls how tightly it's concentrated on the surface. So very smooth or polished surfaces tend to have a high exponent. For this puppy, I'll dial in an intensity of about 0.6, and an exponent of 50. Incidentally, the spotlight is already animated to move a little, so the specular highlight will slide across the surface a bit, which is a nice effect. The final thing I'll do is reduce the diffuse colour to about 0.6, because the diffuse and specular colours get added together, which was blowing out the brightest areas, and obscuring the bevel on the letters. Oh yeah, and I need another 2D texture node for the specular map, so I'll copy and paste one of those. 
OK, it's time to take stock. We've ironed out the glitches which the FBX import introduced, we've hooked up the texture maps and refined the materials. I'll play through the animation to make sure everything's in order. We should have a render which is good enough to build up using mostly 2D effects. This is where the fun really starts and I hope you'll join me in the second and final video in the series where we'll start piling on the visual effects such as glow and lighting effects, heat shimmer, depth of field and much more.